Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, Stephen Brill and his latest book, Class Warfare, Inside the Fight to Fix America's Schools. In it, the founder of magazines Brill's Content and The American Lawyer explores what he believes are the ailments in the public school system and offers his prescriptions. Challenging his solutions and offering a few of her own is education historian Diane Ravitch. Steve, afterwards made a very interesting decision in inviting me to interview you because, of course, we know we're going to disagree, but the show th thought that would be interesting, and I so do I. it's a terrific decision. And, and so, you know, um, if, a, if an author can't defend what he's, um, uh, what he's written to his most likely and certainly most knowledgeable critic, uh, then, he shouldn't be, uh, then he shouldn't write the book. Great. Well, first I'd like to just uh, talk about your own professional history. You're a lawyer. Uh, a journalist. Not uh, a lot. I never took the bar. Okay, sorry. Uh, an entrepreneur, uh, and you have. I know many years ago you wrote a book about the Teamsters. Right. Your most recent book was about the aftermath of 9/11. Correct. Now you have written a book about education reform. Uh, I read the book and I thought that this could well be the next chapter of Waiting for Superman, the uh, the book that accompanies the movie. Although there was one, uh, you featured the same heroes, uh, Joel Klein, who's now advising Rupert Murdoch in the hacking scandal. Uh, and Jonathan Schnur, Arnie Duncan, Michelle Rhee, Eva Moskowitz, Kip, Teach for America, and like the movie, the teachers' unions are the biggest obstacle to reform. So I should say that being a historian... Do I get to comment on the... Oh, sure, you can comment on uh, that. The cherry-picked uh, summary that you've done? Well, which, I, I which think Which reminds me of how you cherry-pick um, a lot of uh, your data. Well, come on now, I'm the interviewer. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, uh, I don't think that is a, a fair description of the book. I would venture that uh, that several of the teachers' union uh, leaders who were portrayed in the book, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, the woman who runs uh, the union um, in Hillsborough County, Florida, would not say that she's a villain. In fact, she's one of the no, heroes. No, no, I the didn't book. say they were villains. I said that in the book you portrayed the unions as an obstacle to reform. The unions are an obstacle to okay, reform. Okay, that, that, that was that what I said. Accurate. Okay, so as a historian of education, I was very interested in the book. I learned a lot from it. Uh, because you have access to people that normally don't speak to reporters or, or to people like me. And one of the very important groups in your book is Democrats for Education Reform. Can you just describe what this group is, who created it, and what it does? Uh, it was created by a small group of frustrated education uh, reformers. And as you have uh, seized on uh, repeatedly, they happen to be well-to-do frustrated education uh, reformers who were Democrats and they had an epiphany early on when they were trying to help uh, charter schools like KIPP and, try and, and, and just beginning to get involved in the reform movement. The epiphany they had was that uh, the Democrats, their party, their party that they thought uh, stood for civil rights, were, uh, were uh, the political party that was most in the way and what frustrated them was they consider education reform to be the civil rights issue of this era. And they just really couldn't believe that it's their party that is blocking their idea of, of the reforms uh, that are necessary. So they describe it uh, repeatedly, and this comes up in the book, I mean, uh, the book often, as sort of a Nixon to China uh, gambit in which uh, you know Democrats are going to uh, reform the Democratic Party, and they've, uh, as you would probably agree, they've made lots of progress. What you wouldn't agree on is um, the value of that progress, and you'd be concerned, as I am, about uh, the sources of their funding. Now, you, as you know, you, I'm you, concerned about everybody's source of funding. You you did mention in the book that Democrats for Educational Reform spent 17 million dollars in a three-year period to influence state and local races. Yeah, which uh, is about what the teachers' union spent in New York. The teachers' unions across the country have dwarfed what, you know, what Democrats for Education Reform spends, mm -hmm. what anybody spends. They are the largest single uh, contributor to political campaigns of any interest group on the planet, including the largest corporations, uh, the largest unions, the largest trade organizations. So mm -hmm. they're sort of on their way almost to matching the teachers' unions, but really not close. But the difference, of course, is that the teachers' unions represent people who work in schools, whereas Democrats for Education Reform is composed 
their money comes primarily from Wall Street. These are Wall Street hedge fund managers. Is that well, not true? Well, what they would say is uh, they're citizens, just the way you and I are. Um, a lot of their money comes from contributions, and a lot of their money comes from, you know, from people who work on Wall Street, who work on Main Street. But uh, you're absolutely right. It is a, a, uh, the money that finances the teachers' unions come from uh, the taxpayers, because the taxpayers are the ones, for example, who pay teachers uh, to work on uh, union matters and not have to work in the school. The taxpayers well. are the one who pay the teachers' unions um, the kinds of uh, you know, salaries and benefits they get, which allow them to charge uh, the heavy dues that they charge. Do you, do you think the public schools would be better if there were no unions? No, not at all. I think the public schools would be a lot better if the unions uh, took a different position about uh, protecting the adults instead of protecting the children. But as I outline in the book, as you well know, ultimately uh, the way really to fix public education in America is to get the unions on the side of reform, which is gradually starting to happen. Do you, have you noticed that the, the states with the lowest test scores on the national exams are the right to work states where the unions well, you are the know, weakest? That's, that's one of your and classic the, and the pieces states, of and cherry the states picking with, It's not cherry picking. This is in the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I was a member of the National Assessment of Education Progress Board for seven years. The highest performing states are Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey. These are right. three strong union states. The, the highest, lowest performing states are those where the unions are weakest. Well, the unions aren't weak in those uh, low-performing states, and the unions everywhere. I mean, to say that schools are high-performing, uh, which states did you just mention? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Connecticut. Right. New Jersey. Okay. Those Does are the anybody, three highest states. Is there states. anyone on the planet who thinks the New Jersey public school system is a successful Actually, school system? Actually, the, is there anyone on the, the planet low who low-performing schools are concentrated where there's high poverty and high racial isolation? Right. The, we all but know New that. Jersey as a whole, if you, again, you have to look at the national data. Right. The national data is that New Jersey is a high-performing state as compared to uh, the South and many other states in the Midwest and the well, West. Well, again, if you look at concentrations of high poverty, that uh, the formula you've just described uh, would change. But the basic argument of the book is a rather simple argument, and frankly what I find is that people who argue against the basic logic here are the same, it's the same type of arguments that the tobacco companies made when they said there's no evidence uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, cigarette smoking causes cancer. It, it, it cannot be denied that if you have a union contract that does not allow a principal to supervise a teacher, that does not even allow a principal to comment on the form of the teacher's lesson plan that pays teachers 13 to 15 sick days or personal days in a 35-week school year, it cannot be denied that that is not an optimal environment to get the kind of accountability. Okay, the now other see. basic argument in the book, the basic argument in the book, and I, you know, and I haven't heard anybody dispute this, is you have in K-12, to the largest single occupation in the United States except for retail sales clerks. It's the largest single occupation. It is the only occupation anywhere where the way you get compensated is based solely on how long you've been breathing. And it's a pretty important occupation. The simple logic of education reform, now the details get a lot more complicated, and you're an expert on this, but the simple logic of education reform is to have an accountable system. And everybody involved mm -hmm. should be accountable. You know, I think the people we, who we are donating to, that, to the charter schools should be accountable. Let me ask you questions. Sure. Um, charters are mostly non-union. I've guessed and I've talked to some of the big charter supporters. And I used mm -hmm. to be a charter supporter. When I was on the right wing and it was in the Hoover Institution and the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation, very conservative institutions, they had exactly the same agenda that you have. The unions Excuse are me, I don't have an agenda. No. There are two no, no. people on this the program today. Choice. I have no agenda. Okay. You I'm have just taken telling. money no. from the teachers' unions to make your argument. No, I have You not. have taken speech money from them. That's I am a journalist. True. I do not have an agenda. You can accuse Steve, me of a hundred things. Excuse me. I you have can say spoken. every single page in I that book spoken. is incorrect, oh, but I do not have an agenda. Okay. I have spoken over a hundred times in the last year, 18 times to the unions, locals. Most of those appearances were for free. Sometimes I was paid $1,000. You just won't tell us which ones you got $10,000 for, 5000 uh, This is not my interview, okay? Charters are a major element in the reformers program. This